Have you ever wondered why sometimes a great leader is that calm, quiet person? And sometimes they're that wild entrepreneur who just gets things done? That's what we'll talk about today. A leader is the one who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. John C. Maxwell. Today, we're going to talk about a book called Marking Up the Wrong Tree, the surprising science behind why everything you know about success is Mostly Wrong by Eric Barker. The truth is that sometimes I come across these books and I'm not really sure where they come from. And I saw this in my list of books I had and thought it had an interesting title and the first few chapters of it were fascinating. And I really liked this book. He's a neuroscientist who has a successful blog. In his successful blog, he has a number of articles about four things that most organized people do or how to have a long, awesome life, five secrets from research. This is right up my alley, this kind of thing. And I know he speaks on other podcasts, which is probably how I came across his books. But he tries both in his blog and his book to back up everything that he's saying and tells you where he gets it from. It had a lot of research and a lot of practical advice. And what he tries to do in this book is go over a lot of the advice that we've heard of about how to be successful and how much of it is actually right or maybe partially true or has truth in it or maybe is completely wrong and tries to either bust the myth or support the myth. Sometimes they're absolutely accurate. So we're going to break this podcast up into three different parts. The first question is, how do we become great leaders? What is the successful way that leadership can happen? Is it being someone like a visionary, like Winston Churchill or Steve Jobs? Or is it better to be the quiet, calm leader who makes things happen in a very methodical way. The second part of this series is going to talk about whether or not you have to be a nice person to get ahead, or maybe nice people don't get ahead. And then the last part will cover the other topics that are in this book. But I thought that the first two were so fantastic that they really deserved a deep dive. And so he starts off with the question about what makes a good leader and talks about Neville Chamberlain. And if you don't know who Neville Chamberlain is, he was a person who was trying to negotiate with Hitler to see if basically they could avoid war in England. And at that time, the British people were shocked about it because Hitler was starting to show his hand. Word was getting out about what he was doing. And the British were under threat a great deal. They're a small island. And so in the case when they were looking for a world class leader, they just didn't say, get us the best leader ever. And according to Barker, They were actually just saying, get us a better Neville Chamberlain. When you look at leaders and you think back at fantastic leaders, sometimes you might think of someone who came up with an innovative solution to a problem or someone who brought a nation together, maybe someone who was able to solve a complex problem or think outside the box about how the nation can move ahead. But in this case, they needed to fight someone awful like Hitler. And so they needed someone like Churchill. Churchill, when you look at him, you probably wouldn't have given him an advancement in a job for his great leadership. He was kind of a jerk at times. He was often wrong. And he said some very horrible things about other races and places in the world. And so you could easily come up with this question that says he's going to be a terrible leader. He's paranoid. He makes enemies quickly inside of his own government. This is not the guy to lead us. But Churchill was absolutely the guy to lead England at the time when they're fighting Hitler. And so then you might say, well, why is that? So then a book came out by another fellow named Gautam Makunda, and he's a professor at Harvard for Organizational Behavior. And he wrote a fascinating look about Churchill called Churchill the Failure, The Paradoxical Truth About the Best and Worst Leaders. And the reason that that book was so fascinating to Eric Barker is it just wasn't a political hit one way or the other. Churchill's the best. Churchill's the worst. It actually said, why was Churchill in this one specific location a fantastic leader? When probably in most cases, and some could say after the war was over, was not so great of a leader. Sometimes you might need a very specific person at a very specific time. And that was the point that Eric Barker is making, that sometime the right place brings out the right person. 
regardless if they're the nice guy or maybe the jerk. But Makunda in his book found that there were certain characteristics that in the right situation, he called intensifiers. And that means that maybe in some cases, your biggest weakness might be your biggest strength. You've heard of people who are visionary, maybe people like Steve Jobs, maybe people like Gandhi, who in any other time might have been divisive or might have not worked out the way that you thought they would. But in that key moment in history, they were the perfect person for the perfect job because they had certain intensifiers, previously known as weaknesses, that somehow worked in this point. He kind of brings it up as genetics, that sometimes you might have a gene that does great harm to you, but in other situations, it does good things for you. He also mentions like maybe it's a knife where sometimes a knife is good. It's going to help you do surgery. And sometimes a knife is bad. It allows someone to cause violence. He gives the example of Steve Jobs, who was an out of the box thinker. He always tried to look at things in a really different way, which was important to invent Apple. It was important to look at computers a whole new way. Steve Jobs was involved in Pixar. He started it. And when they had their first few successes, And then it just kind of died out. It really wasn't doing anything unique. And it really wasn't doing anything that was winning fans over in their new cartoons. Steve Jobs said, give us the black sheep. I want artists who are frustrated. I want the ones who have another way of doing things that nobody's listening to. Give us all the guys who are probably headed out the door. And that means he really needed someone who thought outside the box who had that unique skill that nobody else did. Because the people who have the standard skill, you'd look at their resume and you'd say, they're perfect for this job, was not doing the trick and being creative. And after that point, Pixar was coming up with really creative movies. I mean, I remember them all. They're weird. They're fantastic too. And they're really funny. And Pixar just had that way of making something unique. He talks about the average Silicon Valley entrepreneur and says they have a stereotype. They're balls of energy. They never sleep. And they're huge risk takers. Working for an entrepreneurial company, I can tell you that's absolutely true. It's a fantastic ride to be in an entrepreneurial company, which I always called being a bit like on a speedboat because you weren't quite sure where you were going to zigzag the next time. And he said that this is all related to a trait that's called hypomania. Johns Hopkins psychologist John Gartner did a lot of research that says it's not a coincidence. What produces these relentless working machines that never sleep and never forgive and keep going and have confidence beyond what they probably should is exactly what you need when you're creating a creative new company. It makes that company successful. But if you were looking at a resume for an employee, you probably wouldn't hire someone like that. He also mentions that people who were greatly successful are people like Abraham Lincoln and Gandhi, Michelangelo and Mark Twain. And he said that all of them were orphans, that in most cases, being an orphan does not give people an advantage. But in some cases, it allows them a different kind of upbringing that makes them special. I think that's why when you look at all the books, Harry Potter and every other book that's out there, Primarily, the main character in children's books are orphans because it gives them the freedom to do things that kids with parents could never do. So it really highlights the question, should we be the rule follower? Should we play it safe or should we be the rogue and take risks and do things that other people would never think to do? And he said the first most important thing is that you really have to know yourself. And bring forward what's inside of you to its best ability. If you are a risk taker, figure out how to be the best possible risk taker. If you're not that kind of person and you're someone who's very steady, you're playing by the rules, and you are what he calls a filtered leader, then make sure you figure out what your strengths are with regards to that. He suggests that in the personality test, the big five, that means that you're high in conscientiousness. And that people in this particular category of the filtered leader do best when they have a place to be, a company to feel a part of, something to belong to. But if you're that unfiltered leader, and it's the leaders that we were just talking about, the people who are really on the edge and doing all the risk taking, 
that by dampening what he says are those intensifiers, you might be denying what your key advantage is. And so that's where you have to figure out you again, know yourself. And I think it's important to know that each side has its positives and negatives. And when you're looking to figure out what your intensifiers are by knowing these types of things and figuring out where you're actually going to be your best, that's what's going to happen to it. He brings up the book by Peter Drucker, Management Challenges for the 21st Century. And he says that it all comes down to exactly what they were talking about before, that you have to know yourselves in terms of what you want in life and in terms of what your strengths are. He says that it should be like the people who know they can pick something up and be confident it is going to be a success. They know they're going to be great at it. They know that this is something that they're actually going to like doing and it's going to go great for them. But then again, there are those other people who are just confident about, I'm going to create this business and it is going to be the next store that takes over the world. And maybe you're not that good at it. You're not going to get the things that you actually want. He says that a lot of people really struggle at this point without knowing what Peter Drucker asked. What are you good at that consistently produces desired results? That's what you have to figure out. And Peter Drucker has this small system in place that he calls feedback analysis. And when you do that, all you do is you're going to write down your projects. You're going to write down what you plan to do, what you try to do. And then you're just going to write down how it went. Was it a success or did not go so well? I might even say, if you could put in there why it didn't go so well. And he says that you will see the pattern come out of this list of items. I think that's what helped me in a lot of cases, because at some point I figured out the things I'm good at. I had feedback from other people who told me the kinds of things I was good at. And I started trying to focus on those things. I stopped trying to be good at the things I thought I should be good at and instead focused on the things I was actually good at. The second piece of advice that came from Mukanda's book was pick the right pond. And that means you have to get that right environment that really works for you. An unfiltered leader who could be really great at one company might be terrible at another company because that company is expecting them to be a bold, fantastic leader when they're more of a calm, patient, progress type person who doesn't have those Steve Job, Winston Churchill type skills. They're not that person. But sometimes a company needs that person. Sometimes a company needs the calm, collected, thoughtful leader. So if you pick the right place to be, you'll be in the right situation to do the best you can. And you always think about some people who are just fantastic at nonprofit charities, where they're able to go to a certain community or town and really turn things around. Maybe they develop a soup kitchen that saves a lot of people and helps them out. That's their right pond. I can tell you, I used to work for a nonprofit organization and it was downright disastrous for me, at least. I think I did a good job there. I liked doing something that benefited the world, but it destroyed me a little bit because you would sit there and think, well, should I go and read this book or should I try to save the world? And saving the world always won. And so eventually I realized I had no life. I was having so much burnout, I couldn't even begin to tell you. So picking that right pond and knowing which environment's best for you is great. I know people who cannot work inside of an office. It would darn near kill them. But for me, offices are fine. I like the regular paced behavior of what an office type job gives you. And some people just don't like that. They want a more exciting situation. So you have to figure out which pond is best for you. And I think, too, you have to decide what size company you want to work for as well. Sometimes people don't feel like being a little tiny bitty number inside of a vast corporation. They do better when they work for a small organization. So think about that, too. But he says that if you're more of that unfiltered type of leader, risk is your friend. You were built to do new things, to invent new and exciting pathways. And that if you actually embrace some of your flaws, you'll do better. Even though it seems a little unlikely, those types of things will help you succeed more often than fail because it has given you a certain outlook and a certain drive in your life that will make you great. I had the question about myself, about whether or not I could ever make a great leader. 
because I'm not a crazy entrepreneur. I'm not someone who's hyper energetic. I'm a very steady, calm individual. Can I be a leader? Can I manage people? And then for about a decade of my life, I became a manager and I think I did pretty well when it came to the very core parts of the team. My team was successful. We got the things done that we needed to get done. And we had some of the best statistics in the company. Am I a visionary? Am I someone who can invent a new system or create a new pathway? I'm creative, but I'm not Elon Musk who can barnstorm new ideas. And so it made me wonder if I ever could be a leader in a bigger company, in a bigger way. And that's what this chapter really talks about. And so I really appreciated the thinking in this book. And hopefully you can see in the course of this book that leadership takes a strange take. It's not always the person that we idolize as a great leader who ends up having to be the leader at that moment. Sometimes it's someone that we look at it a little bit sideways because we don't trust exactly who they are or what their strengths are, but they were that right person at that right time. And when that happens, it can be really amazing and frustrating and scary, but in the end, amazing. And now our fun entertainment quote of the week comes from Tyrion Lannister. I don't like threats. Who threatened you? I'm not Ned Stark. I understand the way this game is played. Ned Stark was a man of honor. And I am not. Threaten me again and I'll have you thrown into the sea. If you ever read the Game of Thrones book, you'll realize that the whole book is about people trying to take the throne, trying to take the leadership of this whole region. And you'll see the strengths and weaknesses of all the people who try. And who was always my favorite? Tyrion Lannister, because he always said the thing that needed to be said. I don't know if that made him a successful leader, but it made him one of the best characters in the book. All right, everyone, thanks so much. Have a great week. And if you please remember to subscribe to the podcast and write a review, I'd appreciate it.